Welcome to another episode of Exploring the Vintage NFT Space podcast with Zero G. Today, I'm excited to have with me uh, Shaban, the creator of uh, Everdream Soft and Spells of Genesis, as well as Munga and other projects. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks for inviting me. Very happy to be there. Yeah, really excited to to talk to you today. Um, you know, you've had such a um, a massive impact in the uh, vintage NFT scene with you know your projects and your work and your ongoing efforts in um, in Counterparty. But before we talk about that, why don't you tell me the story about how you um, you first uh, found out about uh, crypto and what actually inspired you to actually make your first purchase. Um, so when we talk about crypto, um, so I started uh, uh, early on uh, in around 2012. Um, I I saw news about this currency called Bitcoin, and um, I saw the news that it was at fifty dollars, and then suddenly jumped to one hundred, and then two hundred, and I thought, oh, I need to buy some. Uh, then it was super complicated to get Bitcoin at that time, so I for I forgot it for 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 a little little bit of time. Then suddenly I saw another article saying oh, Bitcoin doubled from one hundred to two hundred, uh, and I and I thought, wow, I I missed the boat, um, which is very sad. Um, so I thought, okay, let let me let me buy um, some Bitcoin, um, and I made the effort. And there was uh, like one uh, counter in Switzerland, um, very far away where I live, where they were selling Bitcoin. It was quite hard at that time to acquire some. And um, I bought um, I bought the Bitcoin at that time. And then I started learning about it, like how how it works and understanding it uh, um, deeper, like blockchain and everything behind. And uh, as soon as I started learning about it, I thought this is really a game changer. This is really big. The impact, the importance, um, the impact on our society of decentralization I, I started realizing this by discussing on the forum, looking at different projects that existed. At that time, there was no Ethereum. There was uh, mostly uh, Bitcoin and some other altcoins that were at a different, I would say, parameter than, um, than Bitcoin. But the emulation and the energy that was in the community at that time uh, was really amazing. Every day, there was great great new ideas new projects um now there is also every day new projects uh and it's really hard to, to to follow but at that time it was really more people who are into the technology who really understands and not cash grab because um it was not uh, a big thing in term in term of uh, of business so it was really innovators and creators and i was really amazed by the the space and i thought this will change like everything you know that's cool that you uh you recognize that so early on i know um i know after i i got uh, i bought uh, like a tiny amount back in 2012 and um you know, I came from like a, like the hard money, like uh, background and um, it, like, I, I remember following it early on and and what was exciting to me at the time is some of the, like, like you said, the decentralization that like wasn't possible before then where, you know, some of the news back then, like really um, that, you know, moved the price back then was things like that, uh, that Cyprus bank bail-ins and all that other stuff that, you know, it gives people an opportunity to have sovereignty in their own finances and um, not be like really at the mercy of these banks and banking systems. So, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, there's a ton of, um, you know, ton of possibility there. Yeah, that's definitely cool. Yeah. Yeah, I felt this is a little bit like the end of feudalism where um, a new era where people like not from high high blood could uh, start trading and earning um and people like lords uh had the ground but the uh the people 
um, from from low cost could like benefit and uh, and de develop themselves. And I felt that um, it is like we are at um, I would say a new era, the after capitalism, where in capitalism you need uh, capital. Uh, in order to to create and uh, create value, and um, with decentralization, um, it's it changed a little bit the model because even uh, you can own a fraction, even if you don't have capital, you can own a fraction of something, of a project or 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 an idea, even though you are not um, you don't have a big capital. So so I I, I saw at that time, and I still see. A uh, major change, uh, I would say, the, the after uh, capitalism. Yeah, I mean that's a good point. Um, or a couple good points. Like I, that's that's one of the ways I I look at the the banking system is is truly a a a, a really sinister continuation of feudalism in the sense that people don't understand that the um like the, the mechanism and the operation of these centralized the the central banking systems being debt based um at interest it's um it's slavery without the chains essentially but at a but at, at national and, and global level with these currencies it's it's really perverse and um you know that's that's one of the aspects that i don't think gets talked about much with crypto is that it's not debt backed and the, the consequences of that it's you know it's truly free so yeah and um like you said i i it's cool that people um people can like you said crowd uh like contribute to projects and and uh crowdfund stuff with um you know without having you know it's outside the reach of most uh of most people to like do an ipo or or whatever you know anyway yeah it's, it's uh, democratizing for opportunity for little people so yeah, yeah, definitely. And what, what I saw and what I'm still seeing, but it's not fully enforced, I would say. Um, but the, the, the fact that before uh, you need you, you you needed capital to pay people. If you want yeah. uh, people to build something for you, a website, develop, you need mm -hmm. money. Uh, you need capital to pay them. But now you can uh, create a currency for for the project and say I pay you with this, that currency. Um, so basically, you create value. So even without money, you can still build something by uh, giving share of uh, of what you are building. And and this is uh, this is fantastic. And I think that's the the, the biggest change between the capitalism because with the capitalism you need capital to pay to put people at work and here you can start with nothing yeah it's it's incredible yeah like you said but traditionally you need like um in any any sort of previous enterprise you needed you know either the capital or you had to basically go out and put go hat in hand to family or friends or or banks and like you said you you can create from really with nothing just the just an idea now But yeah, um, yeah, definitely, uh, definitely interesting. So, um, you know, so you got, you got invest, you invested pretty early on with, uh, with Bitcoin. Um, how long was it until you heard about like, uh, like NFTs and, and, um, and then counterparty? <laughs> um, so simply said, there was no NFT, uh, at that time. Um, there was, um, so there was Bitcoin and then there was something, uh, called color coin that mm -hmm. was very interesting. It was the idea that you could take a fraction of Bitcoin mm -hmm. and you could, uh, say, okay, it represents something else. Um, like for example, my currency, um, to, uh, uh, to, I, I create my own tokens. Um, but basically it's like taking a Bitcoin and painting it. And, uh, Vitalik actually, uh, contributed, uh, to, uh, to the colored coin white paper and colored coin had a great video, explanatory video that you can still find on, on YouTube. Um, and that was the, the very first idea of tokenization. So using 
the Bitcoin blockchain, instead of making a, another blockchain that is mineable, uh, there was a lot of different uh, chains that were forks. Um, the idea was to use the, the Bitcoin blockchain to create your own token. So that was color coin and I play a little bit with it. And um, one of the problem of uh, color coin, it was that uh, if you use a color blind, how they called it, color blind wallet, so another Bitcoin uh, wallet that is not color coin compatible, you might lose the information. So basically you might lose the token if you transact with the um, with color coin. And uh, there, there were, uh, other projects uh, coming in, like uh, Mastercoin, that offered the the same idea, and another one uh, was Counterparty. Um, and Counterparty um, was designed to create like currencies, um, sub currencies for uh, finance mostly, um, with the idea that I can create my Shaban coin or shares of my company on chain. Um, and they had something uh, that was super interesting was the DEX. So you could decentralizedly trade tokens uh, for another. Um, and uh, those tokens were mostly currencies, only currencies, basically. And um, But you could use the, uh, the, uh, the DEX. And this was, of course, uh, amazing because, uh, as I said, I believe that uh, we are in a society where everybody, uh, we are evolving to a society where anybody can create his own currency, his own token. Um, and um, I thought that will change really a lot of verticals. And my vertical was gaming. And um, because we, uh, I founded Everdream Soft in 2010 around the mobile game. And in 2010, uh, mobile was very interesting uh, market. Um, it was new, the iPhone just came out, the App Store uh, and the, the model. And there was new application and new ideas every day in 2010. But in 2014, uh, the market was already saturated and the innovation came really on uh, the blockchain. That was a, a super interesting thing, or, or Bitcoin. It was a super interesting thing because the, the mobile market became boring, I would say. And um, in all like the, the renewal excitement uh, I got this time uh, for this technology, I immediately thought, okay, how can we use it into uh, the gaming environment? Uh, so I, I thought, okay, so this counterparty allows to create currencies, uh, and this currency can be held decentralizedly on a wallet in a decentralized manner on a wallet. So why not uh, putting uh, game items instead of creating a currency? We'll, we'll create a game cards, and this um, this uh, tokens, so these currencies. Uh, would represent uh, game cards. And <clears throat> I thought, um, because before that we had a trading card game and people were exchanging real cards for uh, a, no, a digital card for real money, but under the table, even though it was not allowed by our term of service, they uh, started trading uh, <laughs> cards with real money. <laughs> And, and then they would contact the support and say, hey, my account was hacked. Could you, uh, could you reverse the, the transaction? And um, of course, we had to, to banish this because otherwise we become a bank because we, we, we become custodian of other people's value, yeah. meaning that our database um, holds uh, people's uh, card, valuable cards. So I thought, okay, let's... Um, instead of fighting with this, if we could emulate the, the real world, because in the real world, if you buy a trading card, um, you go to the store and you get it back home and then it's yours. Uh, nobody can refer you to do whatever you want with your card, giving it, selling it, trading it. And 
the uh, blockchain, the decentralization allowed that. Actually telling the user, okay, we're selling to you cards, but then you are free. Uh, you are free to do whatever you want. You can trade, sell. We are not in the middle. Uh, you are in full power, just like physical assets. And that's where the um, the idea came to combine and to use the counterparty and the blockchain technology to uh, into a, a gaming and collectible. Basically. Well, yeah, that's that's awesome. Uh, before we jump into uh, more into spells of Genesis, why don't you tell me about like your, you know, obviously you're an entrepreneur. Why don't you tell me about your background in, I guess, business and and kind of as a as a creator artist sure so i started um game designing uh create games mm -hmm. since uh i'm from the very young age um because i always wanted to create my my own games because i i have um a bit of creativity uh and uh i always love to um to create uh games universe and i noticed that i need to learn programming uh in order to um to be able to uh, materialize my ideas so i learned programming at uh, 12 uh, years old and then i created after my high school uh, study, I I really uh, I took one year off and I worked on a project, personal project called Munga Trading Card Game, um, for for a year, like uh, uh, every day, working uh, seriously, I would say, and then it was on the web. So it was in two thousand four. Um, it was the beginning, I would say, of activities on the web. And I created this card game, uh, Munga, on, on the web. Then uh, I made my um, uh, college, university studies. Um, I kept the project a little bit aside. And at the end of my studies, um, the mobile uh, came, came out, the smartphones. And I, um, I learned development uh, programming more at university and also mobile. I was uh, passionated by mobile development. And when I saw the smartphone coming, I thought that's a, a, a huge market to address. And I decided to take Munga, the game that I made, I would say amateur as a professional and make an um, iPhone version. Um, because at that time there was, uh, the app store, like it, it was really, uh, the iPhone who has this, uh, the store and possibility to, to, um, to create, um, content. Um, and around 2008, uh, nine, I decided to, um, to relaunch Munga in a professional, uh, in a professional manner and create a company. Uh, around it, and that's how Everdrivesoft uh, started, uh, basically. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I know. Um, I remember back with the, the early mobile days, there was that explosion where it was kind of like self self uh, fulfilling marketing or hype. Is that um, you know, like the the kids that were making like the very first apps? Like there are people that made a million dollars off the dumbest apps you know and you know there's so that explosion of uh of interest uh like you said in um in mobile early on and then you know of course everything goes through that cycle where it got super saturated and you know like where we're at today we're just you know you can publish whatever you want but getting found is is a bigger problem so yeah it, it has been become uh, super competitive and um the Wizard Munga, we are, we were uh, very early into the free to play. Uh, as it's a card game, you could buy more cards, mm -hmm. and we we had an advantage, a market advantage, because the game was free, and um, so it higher the downloads and still uh, making revenue because people could buy more card, and that was uh, that was not common uh, at the beginning. There was a free apps. Uh, or the paid version, basically mm -hmm. the demo version or the paid version. So for us, the the um, the mark going to market was uh, much easier uh, than uh, than other. Then the whole industry turned uh, free to play, and um, 
many, many games uh, and competitors came like a Blizzard with Hearthstone, oh, who yeah. had millions and millions of, of marketing. So, so Munga was uh, not in, in, in good shape, I would say in 2014. So that's uh, why also I explored new new grounds because I wanted to go where uh, people will go in few years um, and uh, and and not on on this uh, uh, super competitive market and boring that it has uh, it became. Oh, interesting. So it was that uh, competitive pressure that that forced you to kind of innovate and look ahead to. Um, I remember. Um, you know, you're talking about Hearthstone. That that was like a, and I want to say they were they were making like a hundred million dollars a month or something at one point. They were just gobbling up everything online. Jeez, uh, for a while. I I'm I'm assuming it's still around, but um, yeah, some of those games were were just I don't know, just sucking in tremendous amounts of capital. But uh, yeah, that's interesting. So um, yeah, so you, like you always knew that you wanted to do like games and game game design though as a like early on that was like your your passion yeah yeah, yeah. definitely yeah well that's that's awesome and um you know i assume it's been a, a um you know a rewarding career that you know that's you know taken you here so far right yeah yeah the 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 thing is in in an in another uh, interview i was asked uh, it's the entrepreneur um it's a, the entrepreneur way mm -hmm. um and i was told when i started uh being entrepreneur uh by by someone else like uh, mm -hmm. uh, some some an, another entrepreneur he told me you know uh, being an entrepreneur uh, you have super high high and super low lows um and uh, it's it's really true. Um, the I I did not want it really to become an entrepreneur uh, because people told me then you are changing your job. You are not doing your your regular job. Like if you're a programmer, uh, you want to program. If you are whatever you are, um, entrepreneur is a a a job itself, and you stop doing what you I would say like. So I, I did not want it to uh, to become an entrepreneur at first, um, but I quickly noticed that if I want my idea to become uh, a reality, I will need to do that because uh, if I'm hired, um, even though I have some latitude to propose ideas, uh, you would never um, believe, uh, or people will never believe or or foresee. It's just like when I started with um, with um, with Bitcoin NFTs, uh, tokenizing game items. Um, even my my team was like really not interested. That I did not. Um, uh, understood why or 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 foresee the um, the potential uh, the potential in that. So yeah, being an entrepreneur is uh, is um, is a lot about resilience um, because you have the vision, you see that it is going to be something. Uh, there is a way there. And um, like with the heart, you like with the hard time, you you continue pushing the uh, the um, the work till you arrive where you want to be. Yeah, it's interesting. So when you so you you just mentioned that when whenever you were you had the idea to to go with um, blockchain, your your existing um, employees didn't think that was a good idea. Yeah, um, the yeah, um, yeah. I, I would say very few people uh, understood um, or or um, um, adhered to um, to to that vision or understood the um, the added value, and even uh, even the players. So the Munga community, uh, I came to them and told them, "Hey." you're exchanging card for money under the table. But here, I'm going to offer you uh, on the next project, uh, next uh, items, fully decentralized. So you, you take the power, you will be free to trade, exchange the way you want, um, exactly what you are 
expecting from a trading card game. And uh, in fact, very few people from the existing player community also understood the, uh, the idea and the vision. And most of the um, activity and attraction came from the Bitcoin community. So people who were into the Bitcoin community quickly loved the idea and, uh, and uh, like followed uh, Spells of Genesis. But the existing community, the regular people, uh, um, not, not much. Very few players actually created a wallet, which is uh, good for them, for those who make the, the step, because they found uh, uh, they had a, a big treasure uh, later on in 2021. <laughs> but very few people yeah. actually uh, did. <clears throat> Yeah, that, that's that's fascinating that you had uh, resistance from players too, not just employees that you know kind of wanted to stay with how things were. Yeah, and I, I think the, the the people did not understand, uh, and it's still hard, but people did not understand the value of decentralization, true ownership, like owning yeah. something um digitally and still today i would say uh a lot of people it, it it's hard for them to figure out um what's the value of it and um so at that time it was even worse like mm -hmm. trying to explain bitcoin to people it was almost impossible and telling them that we're putting game items on bitcoin blockchain was um was super hard to to uh to un to explain i mean it's such a it it is it's a simple but a really radical shift because again we were talking about some of the other um traditional examples of like um of what was that the blizzard game um we were just talking about it the uh, Hearthstone. Hearthstone, yeah where Heart people people would spend thousands of dollars to have digital cards that they don't really own like if if the apple app store ever ever takes that game down or um, or blizzard decides to shut down the service or whatnot you don't have those assets anymore it's i don't know it's it's a really um like you said you can't uh you can't trade freely and and all the all the other benefits of of true ownership you know that that old legacy model yeah it, it's crazy right um of course for me uh, i still have a hard time to understand why it it is not perceived more but in 2021 when there was the nft craze uh, uh the the nft also received a lot of backlash uh and a lot of game projects like ubisoft uh tried to put nft and the player hated it and they put them into flame for for uh, for nfts and the perception um, of the the user, it was like it was a dirty way to uh, uh, to gain more money, um, like the the same ways as drug dealers are using cryptocurrency. Uh, this uh, game studio are selling us uh, NFTs uh, for uh, to 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 make them richer, um, and and so it was really hated by 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 the the community. When I started, it was not understood. Then in 2021, it was hated by um, by the, uh, the 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 community, but I, I think we did not reach we did not reach a productive state for mm -hmm. true ownership. It's gonna be deployed more and more, but it's still a hard path because there is a lot of risk. Um, of uh, being scammed, hacked, uh, and of course, a lot of people profit from from uh, from luring people. So it's a bit of the the wild west, but uh, eventually it will it will settle, and at some point, nobody will accept to buy something digitally where they don't um, retain uh, a kind of ownership. Yeah, it and um, I think one of the backlashes with the those traditional game studios they're whenever they saw the saw the hype and were trying to jump on board like the way they were trying to do nfts or, or digital property was super scummy so i think some of the gamer backlash 
was justified, right? I mean, the the big game studios have been, I mean, really terrible in a, in a lot of ways for years and years, right? Not to say that they're all bad, but um, you know, um, it. Anyway, I like I I always thought that um, for years I've always thought that um, once I really found out about NFTs and got involved, it seemed like such a natural fit. I I still think we're going to see um see like this digital ownership model go mainstream though with the assets it it only makes sense i just think um yeah the the, the thing is um of course uh, there is a serious business in uh, in uh, in gaming mm -hmm. and uh some publishers uh, it's very competitive and some publishers uh have bad reputation they 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 try to milk uh, the, the the players as much as possible. Um, so it, it has uh, somehow a bad reputation, but I work closely with Ubisoft um, because we were into their uh, program because when they, they got interested in blockchain and, and um, in different aspects. So they were very early into, the, into it. And I know the people there who are working and they're really, uh, working in good faith and they are really trying uh, to build things on blockchain because they are believers and they have a deep understanding of uh, of, of both. So I won't throw um, like by saying like all the projects were, were, were scammy and I think the ones who get the biggest backlash they did not deserve it. Uh, that's uh, some of course deserve it um, yeah. and but some really did not um, did not uh, deserve it, and uh, there was, I think it's yeah. Uh, there was a big like like you were saying. There was a big uh, overreaction in that gamer community. Like they were like any any time anyone said NFT, I, I you know I was in some of these forums and whatnot. Like people were just knee jerk, um, like having a backlash over nft functionality period it didn't even matter the implementation yeah they were going bonkers <laughs> yeah yeah exactly and actually it reminds me of uh, um, a funny anecdote that i uh, <laughs> i want to share hmm. when 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 i was a child um uh I was playing, so there was Doom, the uh, the game Doom, which is uh, the first FPS. Um, and the um, I was playing with a friend, and the the the, the my friend's mother, uh, she did not like uh, when we said we we're going to play a Doom like because FPS, first person shooter. Um, basically, like many games uh, today, like uh, uh, Counter Strike and and the other. Um, she 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 said like I don't want you uh, to play a doom -like, doom like because it's violent and uh, and uh, uh, so I don't want to to you to play a doom like and actually one day uh, we were playing Counter Strike and the mother came in the room and and she did not uh, say anything while while she uh, saw us playing the game and we were surprised like. Usually it's like she forbid us to play Doom likes, but mm -hmm. uh, she did not say anything there. And uh, then uh, we figure out that uh, she did not understood uh, understand what a Doom like is because she heard that Doom is a game where uh, you you are an, a Nazi and you have to kill Jews people. That was on her mind okay. uh, some yeah. somehow. And when you play a Doom like it's a it's a game like where you are a Nazi and you you kill people, and um, it, it was nothing from the uh, the how the gameplay or how how you play the game or if it's violent or not. She just picture an idea uh, of what is a Doom like um, that was really far from reality, and um, I, I think what happened with. Uh, with gaming and NFTs is really something similar. So you just name the word NFT and then people go crazy because they uh, picture uh, something uh, horrible, uh, scams, uh, things to, 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 to screw people out, but they don't understand like the substance, what we are talking about. We're talking about true ownership, 
full control of your assets. And uh, I think we are we were uh, in a similar situation where the word was not really understood and some pictured some bad thing around it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's just um, um, yeah, there was all these um, all these people like having a knee jerk reaction. They they had no real understanding of what that concept mean. They meant they've just basically saw other people reacting and kind of, you know, or again, had a, a, a third party view on it without actually digging in. So, yeah, interesting. So, I mean, yeah, so kind of circling back, um, you know, so you, you kind of realized that you needed to, you know, to make a shift in order to, to keep your, your company viable back when, you know, you're in that super saturation of um, mobile gaming and, and like wanted to find a new way. What was your vision for, um, you know, at the time you decided to, to look at the, um, at blockchain and look at counterparty, like what was your vision for, uh, initial vision for Spells of Genesis at the time? So <clears throat> the, um, the vision was for Spells of Genesis, um, what was the the following um very very simple uh my bet and my belief at that time is that uh this this ownership blockchain uh in gaming is just uh it's the beginning the the we are starting something and in some years everybody will do um will do uh the same so we called it uh, Spells of Genesis, um, uh, reference as the uh, Genesis block, which is the first block of a blockchain. And um, the idea was to create uh, a game with card um, that will, that will, that integrates a blockchain, but that are at the beginning of something and that's are designed to be in the museum in 50 years when people will look back to see how it all started um they will look at the cards uh, spells of genesis as the the genesis clock the, the starting and um we represented allegorically uh, events that happening on the crypto uh space because the idea what we believed was that um, we are at the beginning of something uh, that's going to be a game changer, just like internet is a game changer 10, uh, 10 years before that. Um, so we want to illustrate that allegorically. So at the same time, it's a collection, it's a game. At the same time, it's a collection. Um, it's a way to teach people as well, like people who are outside of, uh, of this crypto, uh, to have an nice and allegory and something like is, that is um, gamified that illustrates what's happening in the uh, the crypto uh, ecosystem. So we called it spells of genesis as the beginning of uh, of something uh, uh, a way that uh, people will 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 follow um, will follow on in the future. And to have collectible as testimony because, uh, of course, blockchain is timestamp and uh, everything is visible. So the card will stay long after the game as a testimony of uh, how it all started and illustrating, of course, the story of what happened in the crypto ecosystem at that time. That's amazing. You had the um, you had the vision back then uh, of how. You know how big and important you know, um you know blockchain gaming would be um you know and we're still you know as we're recording this in 2024 we're still i think um really just at the at the starting block in in the big picture but you know that was in um you know your first assets were in um in 2015 so that's a um, you know tremendous vision to and the, one of the things i thought was also um really amazing is that you um you know, you approached it very professionally with that vision that, you know, you didn't just throw something out there. Like, again, you, you have like, you know, real art done for the cards that looks, looks great instead of, you know, a lot of the early crypto projects are, are kind of janky, you know, they didn't take 
like the user experience or or the visuals that seriously, you know. So um, I think it's really incredible that you um, you know you you took that seriously from the beginning. Yeah, um, yeah, de definitely, and uh, I think um, the the fact that the studio uh, Everdreamsoft had um, experience in uh, in in gaming uh, allowed us to to have a, a game that was, and I would say still that is still quite high in terms of uh, of um, quality, uh, whether. You, you look at the game in, in, in its full. Um, because, yeah, of course, pioneers, and it's normal when pioneers uh, are, are coming, they come with low budgets. And um, so you usually have a lower quality. So so that's um, that's normal. Same for the mobile games in general. Uh, uh, in 2010, the, the, the budget were low and things were very, very simple. And uh, we we went we were there as well when we started Zumunga uh, on 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 mobile. It was really uh, I would say handcrafted uh, when it comes to UI and interface. Um, but the images uh, there were since I would say the beginning of Munga uh, high quality and. It was not an easy start like to get really professional uh, images. We had to create a network of uh, of illustrators. And the first images that we had on uh, on Munga were we just asked permission uh, on the, the first car set uh, of il existing illustration. Then we grow a bit bigger and we could like create our own uh, illustrations. And of course, we came with, with that experience when uh, we entered the uh, the blockchain space. Yeah. So well, when you kicked off Spells of Genesis, or were preparing to launch that, so you, were you just um, contracting out with the artists that you already uh, had contracted with, or were these in-house artists at the time at the beginning? So it's a network of uh, artists that worked on Munga. So basically, uh, we leveraged the the, the same network of. Uh, of creators for uh, for illustrations. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, um, so you made the decision to 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 pivot and and to um, to launch Spells of Genesis. So, um, tell me about how you decided to to start out with FD card. Yeah. So the uh, the FD card um, was. Uh, an interesting one. So it's the first card that we released for Spells of Genesis, but it was released for both Spells of Genesis and Munga because the game Munga was still operated. Um, so the card was playable. Spells of Genesis was not existing. So that was the first, I would say, Munga card um, that came um, on chain. And the idea as we were fundraising for, for Spells of Genesis, the idea is to get known with it, the uh, the community uh, and also to do a good action. Um, and there was a great project called uh, Folding Coin. And uh, Folding Coins would reward with their token uh, people who are folding. So um, basically putting their computer power to find a cure for, for cancer. And this is a Stanford uh, project. And basically the Stanford project hold a leaderboard of uh, who contributes to um, to the system. And the idea of uh, folding coin was to give tokens to people who participate to, uh, to that Stanford uh, project. So <clears throat> very interesting idea. Um, the idea was to use your power instead of mining Bitcoin um, for for nothing. You uh, you mine by uh, solving equation that might find a cure for uh, for for cancer. So the idea was was really interesting. So it's not a real mining per se per validation block, but it's a way to reward people who put their, their uh, contribution. So we decided to uh, team up with them to do an airdrop of, of our first card uh, before we start selling them um, to people who actually are uh, folding token. 
So we offered uh, the FD card as well as Bit Crystals, which is the uh, currency that we uh, mostly use in uh, Spells of Genesis ecosystem and to sell cards. And uh, we make a distribution schedule to people who started uh, folding. And that was like the first issue uh, of, uh, of, the, of the card. And so we distributed it, um, I think, in April distribution or May distribution. Not uh, complete, uh, completely sure. And the card, the the asset was divisible uh, because at that time, um, so counterparty allows to have div divisible and non divisible. And um, the the folding, since a lot of people might not reach the threshold to uh, to hold the full uh, FD card, we decided to make it divisible so people could hold a fraction of it. And still at that time, so um, again, the word NFT was not existing. Um, so um, so it was uh, collectibles, on-chain collectibles, on-chain cards. And the, the question was, should a collectible or game card be divisible or not? And um, we were still exploring that. Um, so we issued some cards that were divisible and some other not. Uh, at the very beginning, uh, after that we settled for uh, for not divisible, and I think the the whole industry uh, settled uh, uh, for for that. But the fact to have divisible, so the idea was clear. So if you hold point nine card, uh, you cannot play it in game. If you have one point zero, you can have one in in the game, and if you have one point five, you still have one in the game. But if you have two point one, then you have two. So you need to reach like a full uh, in order to activate it in the game. So the first uh, spells of Genesis card was divisible. Uh, is is still uh, divisible. And um, we were exploring um, if the card should be uh, uh, divisible or not uh, divisible. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, and um, and so you're like the the model for spells of Genesis was going to be similar to Moongin, where you're selling cards. And like I know you said, you mentioned um, not only was there the airdrop for FD card, but you guys sold that out of your shop too for a while, right? No, the the uh, FD card was never sold. Oh, okay. um, the full supply was distributed uh, during the. Um, the hour drop okay but so like the business model for spells of genesis was basically it was going to be similar to moonga in the sense that you're going to be selling selling cards as a way of, of monetizing the game right yes yeah. um uh yes but um it it has uh, two different uh way Mm -hmm. um the one is the the regular way like the munga way and other free to play ways that you receive cards for free uh when you play the game uh they are not on chain uh they are in game and you can buy uh, using in app purchases because also apple and google did not allow um nfts uh to be uh, bought directly in game so you could like any other game uh, by, um, I would say, database um, centralized uh, token, but there were there were a limited number of uh, tokens or assets uh, on chain that you can you can buy, and that would be the on chain card, and those were we were selling them through swap bots um, mostly who were um, tokenly. Uh, tools like an early co company working on on counterparty who offered like vending machine uh where you can uh, sell counterparty token so it was two revenue streams for us um in our purchases for i would say for the normies and regular people because we we did not want it to have something like also too complicated because we wanted people to be able to enjoy the game and and get to know blockchain after without being a roadblock um, and revenue that we were levering, leveraging uh, on chain. So that's uh, two different, I would say, uh, sell channel and, um, and revenue, uh, revenue streams. 
Okay. And I, I have, and I forgot to mention, and the idea was uh, the in-game cards, as we call them. The in-game cards are uh, unlimited supply because you can receive for free when you play. But once a month, you can blockchainize a card, meaning that you can um, a card that is that you level up to the max level. You can receive a blockchain copy of that cards that will go directly uh, to your uh, to your wallet. So at the same time, it's also a play to earn because you can um, play and then upgrade your card and then resell uh, the cards that you uh, that you got. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I I knew that you had the ability to blockchainize uh, some of your assets. I didn't know that it was like a time limited, you know, one per month. Deal, but yeah, I had saw I saw that in the game. That's cool. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's uh, uh, this way we limit the, the the inflow of new cards. That's one uh, that's one thing. But also, it's costly for us um, because we need to um, transaction send transaction to uh, to users um, every time they blockchainize, and of course, um, yeah, people will create multiple accounts and. Uh, and uh, we'll uh, do a lot of things that would be uh, very expensive when we are talking about the Bitcoin blockchain. Oh yeah, I didn't even think about that, but that makes sense as a, um, you know, the equivalent of gold farming or whatever botting. You know, you could have people that would just, if if they could do it too frequently, you just have them basically having just multi farm accounts. You know, just harvesting yep. you know, cards. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, 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 that's the uh, that's the that's the problem of all uh, play to earn right now. Yeah, so so you launched, uh, you started with FD card with that airdrop, and um, so how was the like once you kicked that off? How did the, the how did the reception go for the game as you were you were launching that, and what was the initial feedback? I mean, was it was it success success early on? Yes, <clears throat> it was a what a small community, um, and um, at that time, almost everybody, like in the Bitcoin uh, community, were um, aware of spells of Genesis uh, in a way or or another, uh, and especially the ones who were interested into gamings and uh, and things. So we 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 did an ICO. Um, which the the word was not coined uh, as well at that time. Uh, token sale um, inspired by uh, Ethereum One. Um, they did their token sale, and we we um, reused their term of service and and things like that. At that time, uh, nobody understood about this. When we talk about regulators or 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 the laws right now that are um, really uh, uh, looking at this thing. It was really an experimental uh, way. So we did one of the earliest uh, ICOs. The name ICO was not uh, uh, coined at that time. And we sold, um, it, it was a success. We sold um, uh, for 300, we, we fundraised the uh, Spells of Genesis for 300,000 uh, USD around that. And it was around 970 Bitcoin, I think. Um, uh, uh, yeah. So it was, um, it was compared to what people are raising today in ICO. It was small, but... Uh, we compared on uh, on things that were existing, like on Kickstarter. So compared to a Kickstarter, it was a, a really, really uh, good uh, fundraising. And we were also lucky that uh, over time the Bitcoin like went up a little bit, so it could like help us uh, finance uh, the the game even longer than uh, than. Um, than uh, the the initial uh, pro projection, so it was it was a success, but again in a very small community. Um, mm -hmm. um, yeah, there was people collecting, starting, so we got a good uh, community, um, but it has not the size of what uh, what a community would be, a Web three community would be today. 
Yeah, oh, interesting. And for the ICO, was that was the reward bit crystals, or what was the uh, reward for the ICO? Um, so there were uh, different uh, different stages. Um, so the main reward was bit crystals, but um, you also receive cards. Um, let me check. Let's get, uh, the page is still on, by the way. <laughs> uh, crystals.github.io it's bitcrystals.github.io and there um, you have all the data so you would receive big crystals but also card and uh, some level of investment would give you um, satoshi card and uh, the genesis card among with other perks Oh, awesome. Yeah. And, um, you know, early on that, so, um, you know, these are the, the spells of Genesis as, as far as I'm, as I'm aware are, if not the first amongst the first ever tokenized gaming assets, um, on the blockchain, um, that we, you know, we would, we would think normally about what, a, what a game constitutes. Right. So, um, I know early on as well that um, you know another like uh, Christian Moss was developing um, some early free to play games that also started to incorporate some of your assets as well. Um, did uh, how did you learn that he was uh, he was looking to or he had incorporated um, a functionality from uh, from Spells of Genesis and in, uh, in Saratobi? Um. Uh, yeah, a very nice story. So, uh, first of all, um, I did not um, I, I did not know uh, Chris uh, before uh, before a certain period, but Sarutobi was well known, I would say, in the Bitcoin community before we we started with um, with Spells of Genesis. Everybody knew about uh, about Sarutobi. A very popular game where you can earn Bitcoin by um, by playing the game. Um, then, um, so I, I, I like I, I knew the game like everybody. Um, then at some point I went to to Japan uh, because we had a lot of uh, customer of Munga uh, were Japanese, and then I discussed with. Um, with some people, and uh, I found a partner, Koji, who helped us uh, translating uh, for the uh, Japanese community. And um, he knew uh, Chris uh, Moss um, personally, and um, it was uh, it was a, a a great way to uh, to meet because, of course, I I knew his work. But um, then I got uh, introduced um, to uh, to him, and we discussed a little bit on uh, on our respective uh, project and what we are what we are doing and uh, explaining about Kanda Party, and we decided to work together um, uh, with uh, with um, Koji Indie Square, which was a Japanese uh, company. Um, to uh, create a wallet called Book of Forbes, um, and uh, it's a collectible marketplace for uh, for game items. In two thousand fifteen, I think we started, and uh, so we worked together. And actually, Chris uh, worked uh, also on Book of Forbes, so he programmed uh, the front end while I created the uh, the uh, the back end. And so we, we, we work closely and then um, also on Book of Forbes. And then, of course, Chris integrated in Sarutobi uh, the token capability and um, and everything that we were uh, we were working on. Oh, interesting. Well, that's uh, that's awesome. I um, that's the first uh, as far as I'm aware, that's the first time another, you know, like one of the things that when I, I heard about you know, and thought about NFT gaming, so like the vision I see is that um, this is the first time I, like it happened is that, you know, assets from one game are, are going to be recognized in another. And that, um, like, especially I see with a lot of these historic 
gaming assets. You, I can definitely see in the in the future, not just in games, but other metaverses or or however you want to say it, like um, like people are going to be given perks or or status or what have you for owning some of these uh, assets. So that's the first time that I'm aware of where where another game, you know, is um, is recognizing assets from uh, you know from another company or another game. So pretty cool. Yeah, that that was uh, that that was one of the big idea of um, having decentralized the decentralization, and um, Chris actually added it uh, permissionlessly uh, to uh, to his game, so he did not ask for can I use the 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 character. So um, so so that's interesting, and that that was a big topic of discussion uh, mm -hmm. that. This allows people to actually use other people tokens, and I thought that would be much more used because um, the, the the point is that he added Satoshi, uh, which is the most expen was the most expensive card, a space of Genesis card, uh, trading around maybe. Five hundred dollar to one thousand uh, dollar per Satoshi card. So integrating Satoshi card was uh, a way to attract uh, the uh, richest player from Spells of Genesis to his game. Oh, okay. um, and uh, that's that, that's a interesting because this way you can like even target like a group like people who spend the most to your game, giving them value. And that was, yeah, it was very new. So we, we did not know like what uh, would be the 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 effects and um, will game lose their user base uh, due to other people integrating left and right their assets. And I really thought it would be something that would be used a lot by games or other product to drive user uh, from other uh, games to their uh, own project, but I did not see that um, uh, happening uh, in the web three web three ecosystem um, recently, and I don't know why. Uh, I would say because yeah, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know why it was not uh, more used, but it was really a, a topic of, uh, of discussion at that time. Yeah, I still see, I still think that that's going to happen in the future, and um, at least in these online, like whether you call it a metaverse or or spaces or whatever, I I think we'll see that um, in some of these communities. But I, I still think it makes sense. It still makes sense in a gaming sense too. Um, anyway, yeah, it's surprising that it hasn't, uh, like you said, it hasn't caught on more already. But um, but yeah, the fact that you know, I mean, kind of like the first. Um, you know the first cross game uh, uh use of an asset is is super cool so um and i know he went on to use multiple assets out of um out of spells of genesis right yeah then he added more and then he even made a, a game saratobi island uh that would use any to counterparty token um that was a cool idea as well um yeah chris is very creative he, he he made Takara as well, uh, geocaching tokens on Counterparty. Um, yeah, there is a rich history of uh, creation coming from his side. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so after you know, so after you got kickstarted with FD card and the and the ICO, um, you know, where you were distributing like the Satoshi card and whatnot. So how how did um, after you had that? How did Spells of Genesis progress from there. Are there any other big milestones that you think de deserve a mention? <clears throat> so many, but my my voice starts to uh, <laughs> to be uh, to be dried up. Um, what are the important milestones? Um, many different uh, many different things happened. Um, if I have to name one among uh, many other stories, um, the 
the landscape, how the landscape evolved, um, it, it was pretty interesting um, because the, at the beginning, there was only Bitcoin, I would say, and altcoin. Um, then a new project came, uh, which is Ethereum, that offered smart contract, uh, smart contract engine, and received a lot of funding. So Ethereum received really a lot of, uh, of funding and uh, attracted a lot of developers, a lot of uh, creators, creative ideas, uh, went on with, uh, with Ethereum. And... Um, Ethereum allowed to create token and smart contract, but Ethereum was very complicated at the, at the beginning. It was the, the wallet, the access was uh, super clunky, while counterparty was super easy. Uh, super easy, so creating tokens on counterparty was uh, much more easy than um, Ethereum where you had to deploy a contract. And there was not many tools like that we have today, truffles or or you name it for for Ethereum. So, and the standards were not really existing <clears throat> as well uh, on Ethereum. So the promise of Ethereum was you can do a lot of advanced things through smart contract, but it was very uh, complicated and, and and clunky. But uh, uh, a lot of people. Um, went to Ethereum. So, so the community, like I would say, in, innovator, uh, we were all, I would say, together. Uh, and then it split it uh, a little bit on uh, the Bitcoin maximalist and um, Ethereum uh, developers in uh, in general. And when it comes to spells of Genesis and um, and uh, and projects, uh, many projects throws aside saying uh okay now we go to ethereum because it's the future and um even etherscan uh etherscan they started um uh, as counterparty scan so the first project of um etherscan which is the the most popular uh, blockchain browser on ethereum was a counterparty um a scanner and um, they decided to drop completely counterparty uh, to use uh, to to be um, to be the uh, ether scan. Even though I would say the um, Ethereum, like reading the data from Ethereum on ether scan at that time, was super hard. Like to understand like a token from A to B, uh, it was like impossible. You had to decode, and it was um, it, it was a nightmare. Um, and counterparty states there, it was easier, but uh, counterparty definitely lack of funding, lack of uh, Ethereum marketing, and Ethereum really developed uh, fast. And at some point, um, counterparty was really uh, small, uh, with only I would say a hardcore um, rare Pepe Furar code. Uh, hardcore uh, Pepe in, and Spells of Genesis um, users. Um, and uh, Ethereum really um, took the steam. And um, a lot of people pressure us to uh, spell us uh, SOG uh, to go uh, on Ethereum. And uh, one of the arguments at that time was that Ethereum is faster and cheaper, um, which is still true for faster but uh, not true anymore for cheaper but uh, making transaction on ethereum was super cheap and uh, everybody were moving to uh, to ethereum we decided not to move uh, to ethereum but to uh, implement ethereum as another uh, blockchain and protocol um, going the multi-chain way instead of uh, leaving counterparty but at some point nobody wanted counterparty token and uh, everybody wanted uh, on ethereum and then in 2021 uh people discovered historical nft and that uh, and then uh, nobody wanted ethereum token anymore and all wanted the uh, original uh counterparty tokens so now the most of the volume is on directly on counterparty and uh, on Emblem Vault, which is a wrapper 
uh, for, uh, for 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 counterparty token on on Ethereum. So um, so yeah, that's that's the I would say the um, the uh, the the backstory. I mean, one of the anecdotes that there are many. Maybe we'll we'll do another podcast for for that. Yeah, that's that's definitely a wild progression. Um, I remember coming uh, by finding that you had some assets that were on um, on Ethereum. So I didn't know when you um, when you decided to allow some um, Ethereum um, cards too. But um, yeah, definitely, uh, like you said, you know, Ethereum was the new hotness for a while. So you know, it's kind of um, come full circle for for some of this stuff. Yeah, I um so like going forward, uh, you know, what uh what do you have planned for uh for spells of genesis uh, or what are you looking to to implement for spells of genesis going forward? Any is there any um any anything you have planned in terms of updates or um on the spells of genesis side? <coughs> on spells of genesis side, um we have a uh a big roadmap of different things that we want to uh, uh to uh, to implement um there are several st- things um one that are i would say on the drawers uh one is a new uh, card expansion with a new universe which uh we created uh, quite long ago but we did not release uh, up to uh, this point and there are a lot of features um, in game that we want to uh, to improve on uh, different um, axes. Um, so there is a lot to do uh, on 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 SOG um, and to really uh, push the push the game uh, push the game forward. But um, we identify that if we release a card expansion right now, um, the the um, the group, the users um, that we might reach is too low um, for um, for for, uh, for 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 like for to justify the the work. So we want to grow the community first. Uh, we want to make Spells of Genesis bigger so that uh, a new extension would have more impact. And to make the game bigger, um, we need to lower the barrier of entry. We identify that um, we can easily attract players as um, SOG is a, is a free-to-play, but uh, and web three player uh, 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 users um, but the uh, one of the big roadblocks that uh, people are facing is the uh, complexity around uh, around counterparty, because the the um, the cards are valuable. There is um, people who are who wants to use, but the onboarding on counterparty is too um, is too complicated, too cumbersome, and uh, we decided to focus all our efforts to make. Um, counterparty uh, really accessible, like as simple as uh, Ethereum, um, like MetaMask uh, experience, so that when we um, when we um, uh, uh, buy advertisement for Spells of Genesis, people will uh, stick longer because the uh, experience, the whole experience, is better. So, um, so to 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 answer your question, we have a lot that we want to add into uh, spells of Genesis, but first we need to make the on-chain experience around Bitcoin and counterparty a breeze, um, so that it makes sense to acquire a new user and to um, to grow the uh, the community. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, that, um, you know, segue into talking about, um, I know that, uh, you're working on some, um, you know, on some improvements to counterparty to, to make that happen. So, um, you know, like I know you're, you're developing a new marketplace and web wallet to make, to simplify that, that user experience because uh, until now, um, like the existing counterparty wallets, um, like we have free wallet, which is a desktop wallet, and we have a couple of 
web wallets, but none of them offer like the same user experience that most people have come to expect of like uh, of most uh, crypto users come to expect for uh, like a, a mobile web wallet uh, like MetaMask for for ease of use with you know web applications. So um, I think that's going to be a big improvement to um, you know to allow people to to handle this without having to think too hard about it. Yeah. Uh, yes. And so, so basically, the um, the our goal is um, not only uh, not only the the marketplace, which is a, a very important part, as you as you mentioned, but also the whole um, um, counterparty branding, positioning, marketing. Uh, socials. Um, this is uh, things that I want to put uh, our company at work. Basically, to raise um, the fund, the necessary funds um, to invest into a counterparty uh, in, uh, I would say, user uh, penetration, but also uh, image uh, marketing and communication. Because uh, counterparty is really strong technically, uh, and it has um, uh, one of the original founder Adam came back uh, and pushing a lot of improvement te technically, so make it very solid. But counterparty lacks of um, of image as well, positioning com uh, vibrant community, and there are, there are a lot of creativity, other projects like Rare Pepe and, and many others uh, that would benefit from um, counterparty to be uh, better uh, understood and and uh, and known. As be people are are now looking at tokenization on Bitcoin with ordinals and, and things like that, counterparty is a great solution, but um, does not have the correct positioning. So that's uh, things that we want to um, to uh, to solve uh, in order to really grow the um, users uh, that have access to counterparty, the project, the different project, because then it will create also a benefit, a benefit uh, network effect for counterparty, uh, the project that are on uh, on the counterparty as well. Because right now with spells of genesis, basically we're we're focusing on a very small, I would say, batch of people, uh, but by making counterparty uh, much better, we will reach a much larger uh, pool for spells of Genesis, but also for all the projects that are counterparty related. You know, it's, it's interesting. So um, we've had this year the, the Bitcoin ETFs get approved and we've seen BlackRock and these other mega corporations start consuming a ton of the supply of Bitcoin. And um, ironically, what we've seen is uh, on-chain activity go way down. Like uh, like yesterday, I was doing fees for below a dollar on Bitcoin. Um, ironically, I, I always assumed that uh, on-chain transactions for Bitcoin would, would get tremendously expensive to the point where counterparty would, would only be used for very high value asset transactions you know like either infrequently or in bulk or um, um you know but yeah. ironically i could see this actually like the trajectory we're on at least right now is that um um that you know this could enable people to be able to, to transact on chain on counterparty cheaply for the at least the next several couple of years if this trend can, continues but that doesn't address the security budget of of Bitcoin itself, which is, you know, with the declining fees. And um, I, I've been thinking about that too, in the sense that um, uh, up until now, like the, like there's this whole uh, idea of the security budget with uh, the block reward and everything. But one of the innovations that I saw, um, uh, I think it's actually a post from Christian Moss I saw, and I, I ended up going out and buying one too is the idea of lottery miners right where um people can get these inexpensive like one watt or five watt or whatever like um miners that contribute to, uh hash rate to, to bitcoin in a super decentralized way where you know hey i i, I have like a the, the term lottery miner 
kind of means that um, it's uncontributing so little hash rate that I'll statistically never get a block. But if I do, it's a, you know, to me, it's a huge payout. But it, uh, I think that that could be a, potentially a way where um, the Bitcoin network could be secured in the future, even with um, even without like the 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 security budget uh, in terms of the block reward um, being super high in a sense. Anyway, those yeah. are just a couple of things I was thinking about the future for counterparty and transacting on Bitcoin um, if the fees stay low. You know. Yeah, it, it's um, yeah, it, it's very interesting. Um, I, I did not hear about uh, about this, but it, it is close to um, holding coin idea. Is that you reward uh, mm -hmm. people with some other um, currencies that than the main um, on chain currencies? And when it when it comes to fees, um, that's a very important uh, very important question. Um, I, because when we release, um, actually, uh, we, we were unlucky, I would say, uh, two times in the uh, SRG story, is that when we finish the feature uh, blockchainization um, that we call, where we deliver the token for, for free to user, um, the so we worked on it for, for six months or a year, I don't remember. and But the, the day we release the... Um, the, the feature, the fees were all time high. So sending a token uh, to a player would cost us $30, so around $30 per, uh, per transaction. It was at that time kind of the all time high. Um, so so it was bad luck. So bad timing, the blocks were full and there was the whole drama of, uh, of Bitcoin cash and, and things like that. So, so we release at the bad timing and then um, we integrated Ethereum and then when we finished the in integration and we added the possibility to blockchainize on Ethereum, um, by the time that we finished the, um, the feature, uh, the fees on Ethereum were all time high, uh, <laughs> around $50 per transaction, while the Bitcoin transaction were, were really low. Um, so. The, the, the fee really fluctuates. And what, what one thing that is very sure is um, if the chain is used, uh, Bitcoin and counterparty, the transaction fee will be high. It will always be higher than uh, Polygon or, or some uh, other uh, cheap chain. And um, this, so in my calculation, the transaction fee on Bitcoin and thus on counterparty will always be higher um, and it will not be for everything. So I see it as a little bit like if you have a painting uh, and if you uh, are printing or, or I would say a certificate or anything you want to tokenize, uh, you can print your certificate in uh, recycled paper or you can uh, print it on uh, glass or, I don't know, very heavy uh, paper, for example, very nice paper that will be more expensive. So if you want to tokenize something on Bitcoin blockchain, it is the most premi uh, premium blockchain because it has the, the high, highest hash rate, uh, the, the higher security, potentially higher, highest long longevity. Um, Longevity. Um, so uh, tokenizing on Bitcoin will be always more expensive, but it is like printing or tokenizing your things on a, on a very premium paper. So it's a positioning. So you won't do mass tokenization through Bitcoin, but you will choose it for, for, for things that make uh, sense uh, economically. Yeah, makes sense. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out with the fees in the future. But yeah, exactly. I mean, Bitcoin's never, uh, oh, it's never going to be free, you know, for sure. But yeah, we'll see how it how that plays out. It's um, it's um, yeah, it's definitely interesting. I I know early on you mentioned that you you already had a vision for um, you know, for the future of gaming and and kind of blockchain integration, like. So you launched uh, Spells of Genesis in 2015. When did you when did you see like see something that kind of uh, I guess 
I guess, uh, verified your your belief like where you where you really felt like um like, uh, ratified or verified in, in terms of like your your vision was it in the 2021 boom or or did you object did you always believe yeah. all along that you were going to be right about that so so i always thought um um it, it is it is going to to happen the timing, uh, I was uh, I was unsure. Um, so the I would say the confirmation uh, was so we, so was uh, I would say along the way. But there is always like cycles where people believe in crypto and it's hyped like two thousand and eighteen uh, ICO bubble. Like everybody thought that was the future of financing startups and then it crashed and then everybody thought um, crypto is dead. Um, so of, of course you have, the, the, there is like the fundamental belief of uh, how decentralization will change our, our society. I still have this and I'm, I'm, I'm completely sure of that. And of course, I find it slow. Um, I would love to see a transaction, uh, this uh, change happening uh, sooner. But if you look on how much time usually uh, a technology uh, takes uh, to 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 like to to change the society, it's usually uh, very long. So, um, in a sense, um, it's this change are very happening very in a very short time uh, period. Um, but of course, it takes more time that I would uh, like uh, like to. Um, but um, the, the, the 2021, uh, I was surprised on how fast it happened. So we were at a point where nobody uh, was interested in anything non-financial in blockchain uh, at a point where everybody, every single brand uh, at least thought about NFT if they did not release their own NFT. So suddenly it exploded so fast and it, it was... Uh, it was a great confirmation, of course, like that what we're doing is um, is correct. And then it blew uh, as fast as it uh, it came. Um, that was crazy. Even Justin Bieber had uh, NFT, and and it happened like really, really so too quickly. It it actually happened too quickly. So it, it is. Um, it is a bit detrimental because it left a bad picture of uh, all this uh, ecosystem NFT. And today, most of the people think they are overpriced uh, JPEG scammed, which is often true. Um, but the, the 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 fundamentals, like how it is changing our 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 society, uh, the way we own is being slowly. Um, put in motion and we are only at the very beginning so it's happening fast but still too slow for for my, for my <laughs> thing yeah i mean um you know i think one of the one of the coolest things for um for you and ever dream soft is that um like you you were able to keep a lot of your early assets um just through the the nature of your business so you have kind of like this war chest going forward too um that you know i think are are just going to continue getting you know again we have ebbs and flows but i think are going to continue to be more recognized and more valuable in the future i um um you know i yeah. thought, you know the other thing like when you're talking about the time frame what it reminded me of is um you know remember back in gaming when the first like the big thing was like um like the controversy around horse armor for that first DLC that people paid for, right? It was for one of those um, uh, one of those Bethesda games. I can't remember which one, but I remember there was this big uproar for people paying, you know, paying money for uh, for basically digital property for a game, you know, and you know from that that was that was probably late '90s, early 2000s, and now you know we have entire uh, entire gaming companies and business models built around um the idea of of downloadable content and digital property and i i think we're 
I think we're still in that early phase for, um, you know, for digital ownership and decentralized ownership for, for gaming too. I, we just haven't hit that, um, CSGO moment, you know, where, um, where we have, where it becomes ubiquitous, but I do think yeah. it's, I, I do think it'll happen too. Uh, and, and one interesting thing is that um, when I, I pitched publishers, other publisher in 2015 about putting their assets on chain, um, actually one of uh, the thing they were saying is that we don't want to do that because uh, if people can trade their assets, um, then um, we are not selling the same asset twice. Um, we're selling it only uh, one time. Um, and um, this was at that time, maybe true, maybe not, but my bet was that people were likely to pay more money if they have ownership of uh, the assets. 100%. Um, and um, it actually, we saw that uh, confirmation in, in uh, 2021 where people were paying ridiculously high amounts for uh, a game item, uh, for a small game that nobody knows, if you compare to a mainstream game. Um, but of course, this um, this uh, the this difference were too high. Um, if you are looking some metaverse lands that would cost a thousand uh, or ten thousand, uh, while in another game it would cost maybe. Um, one dollar, uh, you have like a ratio that is much too too high. So the, this industry is still searching itself, like what is the right pricing uh, for something where you retain ownership and that you can trade versus um, the, uh, the 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 previous model. And I think yeah, nobody got the formula rights, but as soon as somebody gets the formula rights, everybody will will uh, copy the model because it would be a, a more monetizing model, more engaging model for, uh, for, for the community. Yeah, exactly. And, um, I mean, it, it seems like such a natural fit too, and, and how like so close into how some of these publishers are monetizing now where, um, you know, they have like season passes where you get basically like time locked act, act ability to get, certain digital property or digital skins or whatever. I mean, in a similar manner, you know, um, there's ways that they could bake in scarcity into that too and, and still um, be able to sell it. And um, I don't know, like, yeah. well, I don't, I don't think like the, like a secondary yeah. market necessarily is a bad thing for, for these assets. I, I think the the killer, uh, really the killer app uh, that um, will really that is doable only with uh, with a decentralized tech um, is um, valuation of the user generated content. So the so right now we're in a model where mostly the publisher uh, create content and sell it to customer. Um, but if you're looking at what's happening in the modding scene, for example, uh, there are people who are creating really great assets, games, ideas, but everything that they create belongs to the uh, company uh, who created the game. Um, for example, Counter Strike was a mode, uh, mm -hmm. was a modification of Half Life. Uh, eventually, it became a company and, and, and everything. But there was so many different uh, of this game who are actually the work of the community. And most of them, they don't get a set uh, for that. Um, and it's very complicated because uh, in a, in a non-blockchain model, uh, how would you pay someone or a revenue share someone um, who creates a, a, nice, a nice asset for, for a game? But with decentralized technology, it is very clear and you can even automate that and you can have a marketplace where people can build on top of your IP and sell to other uh, users and users and everyone benefits. So you can put the rules like uh, if I do with your game engine, if I do something else, I can sell it for the price I want. And then the 
person who purchases it will pay the creator, but also the the original uh, IP owner uh, in a very transparent manner. And I think this is the killer, the definitely killer app that makes um, more democratic, I would say, uh, the, the the creation. Uh, and that is not, uh, and and that's the, the 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 biggest change. It's not like one entity to customer, but it is yeah. a customer that are um, creating the product. Yeah, that's a brilliant uh, a brilliant idea, brilliant vision. Because um, that's um, like there's been so, like you mentioned, Counter Strike was originally a mod, and there's still like this huge mod scene where there's really no way, like easy way for people to monetize and. Um, um, yeah, that that would be like a really great fit. Um, I could see that with other, even outside of games, other digital property too, working in the in a similar model. That's yeah, that's that's cool. 